Okay, I am pushing this stream live, and I'm hoping that it starts to show up on the YouTubes. Let's see if it does. There it goes. Cool. All right. And that's good. I will close that down. Hello, everybody. Just getting started a little bit earlier here because I want to um, vamp a little bit, I guess. Hope everyone's having a good day. Hey, Polly. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, I'll probably just like start talking about stuff while we're while we're waiting. Um, in case anybody didn't know, I'm going to be using I'm going to be using some gouache today. Hey, Betty, hey, Angie. Yeah, we're going to be using gouache today. Let me know if I'm too quiet. If I'm too loud, I can adjust my audio. Good, people can see and hear me. That's exciting. Um, yeah, we're going to do some gouache today. I am early, Rat Mammy. Um, don't really have a clear idea or plan for what I'm going to do today, so we'll just see how it goes. Um, but we'll see how much we can get done. I am not pre-drawing the drawing this time. I'm going to do a very quick sketch. Hey, Joan. That's exciting that you, you showed up. I know this is like very late in your day, so thanks for coming. Um, okay, thanks, Betty. Appreciate that. So yeah, we're gonna we're just gonna wing it today. Uh, I'm gonna do a really quick sketch. I'm gonna use um, kind of an abbreviated version of the Loomis method for constructing the head, uh, just to get some general proportions and angles correct. And uh, gonna kind of cover my choices and colors and things like that a little bit. Um, and I don't know. That's pretty much it. I hope that you all end up either painting along or whatever. It's gonna be a bit of like what I would consider to be like a sketchbook kind of day. So we're gonna do what I do um, when I just like, I'm gonna paint something and we'll see where it goes. Um, I wanna cover uh, materials really quickly, uh, kind of get that out of the way so we can get into the painting um, sooner rather than later because we'll see how much we get done. I'd like to get something done from you all, for you all. So I am going to uh, zoom in and talk about a couple of things. So I have given a little bit of consideration to color choice here. Um, I recently produced a class. It hasn't been released yet, but I, I talk a lot about color in it. And um, I'm using lots of different kinds of paints uh, and uh, like brands of paints. And what I like to do is kind of pick an assortment of the primaries and get a sense of what those particular pigments from those particular brands end up looking like. And um, you can see here on the left, I've got Hol um, Holbein, Windsor Newton, Arteza. Recently picked up some Arteza. It's relatively inexpensive paint, but I wanted to see how the colors looked and everything. It's decent. It's totally decent for, for more inexpensive paint. So um, definitely recommend checking it out if you, if you just want to get a little bit more range in your, in your brands. Anyway, laid out a bunch of different primaries. We got our yellows, we got our blues, we got our reds. And I always do like a just straight out of the tube swatch at the top. And then I do a mixed with white, in this case a titanium white, just to see how the color changes. And then that lets me pick my colors. Um, but in this particular case, I ended up, I'll just kind of show you this. This is a swatch palette of what is actually a, um, what do you call it? A, um, why can't I think of anything anymore? Zorn palette, thank you. Uh, named after the artist Anders Zorn. Common palette that he used to use, which was consisting of vermilion red, uh, yellow ochre, and um, uh, Mars black, ivory black, sorry, ivory black. And you don't have a blue in this, and so you get a very sort of earthy tone palette. But I wanted to see where I remembered. I was like, I can get a decent sort of like earthy orange by, uh, by putting these two things together. And I wanted to make sure I could get that color. So, so what are we using for colors today? You don't have to use these colors, by the way. You can use any sort of primaries. We will be focusing on primaries. So I'm using that Arteza brand um, vermilion red, which is a warm red. So if you have a warm red, that's fine. I'm using ultramarine blue, which is a very sort of common workhorse blue. I'm using Windsor and Newton. 
just I think it's like artist. Oh, nope, it's designer's gouache. And um, I'm using yellow ochre, which is a really earthy sort of yellow. So we'll never get like a really bright yellow in this. So we're doing that. And as always, we're using titanium white as well, um, which is a really opaque white. Uh, cools off your colors a little bit. So we're going to look for adjusting our colors as needed and adding sort of the red and yellow together in very small quantities to warm things back up when necessary. And then I'm going to do something that I don't normally do just for sake of speed, which is use ivory black along with it. Normally, if you've, if you've ever seen me paint, I like to use an optical black, which means combining all of our primaries together and mixing them until you get something that looks like black. You can get a really nice black. And I think personally it helps kind of tie a painting together if you're just sticking with these primaries in white, but we might use some ivory black just to save ourselves some mixing time. Um, it won't drastically change the painting, but just so you know, I don't normally, normally use black. So these are our colors. Um, I am going to use uh, a Prismacolor uh, water soluble color pencil to do my initial lay in and this is not necessary by any means you can totally just use a pencil or you can just start painting if you want to anything is good so I just want you to know that I'm going to use these I like using these as like my lay in because it just ends up like bleeding into the paint and adds a nice little little touch little flavor what else do I have over here so many things uh, oh, you gotta you gotta paint with brushes so I've just got an assortment of brushes. Um, these are just like relatively inexpensive watercolor brushes. Um, good for gouache. Uh, I've got some like fat kind of rounds here that soak up a lot of um, water, which is great. Uh, good fl uh, fluidity, I would say. I've got a, got a flat here. I've got another flat here for doing some more chiseled shapes. We might do a little bit more with these brushes here today and then I've just got an assortment of like smaller rounds, smaller flats, really inexpensive brushes. They come in like, I don't know, 10 pack for six, six bucks um, USD. So I don't know how many of these I'll actually use. I'm probably going to try to stay a little bit more big and gestural so I can get more of the painting done. So I'll probably use more of these like fat ones. So I'll just keep those kind of at the ready. Last but not least, we've got water. Oop, I use two, two cups of water. Um, we've got one that's going to be used for washing out our brushes and then we're going to use one that's going to be used for adding water to our paints. It's important to keep them separate. Um, I usually end up doing a lot of rinsing of my brushes when uh, I end up putting a lot of white in them because white will end up tainting a lot of other colors but I, usually I don't do a whole lot of like rinsing if I'm just moving between between colors. So I think that those are all the materials. Oh one more. Paper and pan. We'll zoom out a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I use a butcher's pan usually uh, for my palette. It's like a tin pan. It's got like a nice white um, glossy sealed surface. Uh, it's got a lip so things don't spill off. I recently started using like a gray palette which is actually I prefer it. Um, I don't know why I didn't use it before but I have like this big one for oil painting. It's huge. So I just recently ordered a smaller one online. It should be arriving soon. But today we're going to use this one. And then finally, paper. Uh, this is a 140 pound watercolor paper that just kind of comes out of a sketchbook. Let's see if I can grab that. Oh, sketchbook. Uh, just using some Strathmore. It's um, this was ten dollars for 12 sheets. Uh, USD. Um, it's good. It's, it's good paper. So yeah, I just pull those out, put it down, cut off the little frayed edge, and we're good to go. Um, before we get started, I do want to promote a new sketchy challenge that's coming out. Uh, the class starts on March 1st, which is in just two days. It's very exciting. I'm one of the featured artists, and it's all about watercolor and gouache. And I want to play a little promo for you. Uh, just to give you a sense of what it's all about. So I'm going to roll this and then come back and we'll do some painting.
And that's the promotion for this challenge. I'm really excited about it. We got uh, uh, 30 days of 31 days, uh, 30 days of artists. Um, I'm one of them. I'm going to be doing two paintings, two demos in mine in particular with a couple of different techniques. Um, I do have a promo code for getting $5 USD off. If you sign up, there's a promo code in the chat. Um, really super excited. Like I'm really bad at watercolor, by the way. So I'm stoked that there's so many watercolor artists and um, that I'll get to learn from them. So a lot of techniques, a lot of really, really, really good people. So lots of great lessons that are going to be in that one. And I don't even know if I can do 30 paintings in a month. That would be a feat for sure, but I will do my best to try. Okay, so we just spent the first eight minutes of our stream talking about a whole lot of stuff. I'm going to adjust my camera here, get all of my things set up. Oh, did I mention paper towels? Lots of paper towels. Always have paper towels. That's really important. Uh, what board? Oh, let's uh, blink. So Better Day 2003 asks, what board would I recommend placing the watercolor paper on? Honestly, you should probably put it on something like acrylic if you, well, I didn't stretch this, so this is going to curl up a little bit here and there. Um, but I'm just working on a masonite sort of board uh, on top of my um, drafting table. Uh, this has kind of become my preferred work surface just because it's really neutral and I don't really care if it gets messed up. Um, so nothing, nothing crazy, but actually I kind of wouldn't recommend using this because it does, it absorbs water, but this is what I'm doing. So you can do kind of anything. Does, there's nothing in particular though. Uh, all right. So I think let's go ahead and get started. Um, you can see our muse here, Tori Cherry. Uh, the muse reference, by the way, is in the description below. Uh, there's a link in the description to the high res version of the image. If you want to paint along or if you want to watch this video later and then paint along. So um, I'm just gonna, like I said, start with like a really simple Loomis method of uh, sketching in the, ooh, I'm gonna lose that, sketching in the, um, the head. And so hopefully you'll be able to see this. I'm gonna go a lot darker than I normally would. Uh, gonna go not a lot darker than I normally would just so that y'all can see it. So always start off with a circle. Mm -mm -mm. I'll step this down one. That way you can see a little bit better. Okay, there we go. Um, and let's go ahead and look at the brow ridge here. Try to see the angle that it's that it's happening at. We are seeing her at a little bit of an upward tilt, so there is going to be a little bit of sort of foreshortening happening. I'm not going to take too much time on this like I said got her hairline right up at the top here and I'm gonna go ahead and do the vertical center line the plumb line and I'm going to do some basic measurements here. I'm just going to get the measurement from the top of the hairline to the brow line. It's going to be the nose. I'm going to make sure I keep these lines parallel because it's really important so that your features don't start looking all weird and drifting all over the place. Same measurement to get the bottom of the chin. Um, I did a little bit of pre-measuring before just with my hand and um, it's actually like the measurements aren't equal. It's smaller up at the top to a little bit bigger here to a little bit bigger here because we are seeing a foreshortened version um, of her. So there's some perspective happening here. This is probably a little bit of an aggressive tilt also. I might try to correct some of these things a little bit. We're going to end up seeing some of these lines once we get into the, the actual painting. So. Um, okay, so we've got that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and also do a side plane here. And we will create the glabella. By the way, if anybody's interested in sort of learning this drawing method for constructing heads, I did create a class for Sketchy that demos this. 
So you can go check out the Sketchy Art School and look for my, I think it's called Drawing the Human Head class. And we go into this methodology in extreme detail. I'm sure some of the folks in the, in the chat have taken that class. Uh, let's go ahead and draw the side plane and we'll drop a jawline. Now we do have a hand hanging out here. I think you can see that. So we will address that in a second. This isn't going to be perfect, and I'm okay with that. Um, all I want to do is draw a portrait today. Again, this is going to be a little bit more like a sketchbook session. So we'll treat it as such and embrace any mistakes and just try to work the problem if um, things start getting out of hand. So I'm getting the ear in here, seeing that the ear is going to be right around the top of her eye. and that the bottom of the ear is going to be just right around the bottom of the nose. I'll zoom in a little bit more. I wasn't sure how much paper I was actually going to end up taking up here. Sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, let's move quickly. We're already 15 minutes in, so I'm just going to go ahead and look for the side planes of the nose. And let's get some eyes going on in here. Just thinking about the orbit and where the eyes would end up kind of sitting in these orbits. Your eye holes, somewhere around there probably. And let's go ahead and draw some lids that go around, go around those. Uh, this, this is actually why I really like the Loomis method is because it helps you get all your features in relatively quickly. And then you can really start focusing on the details, knowing that you've got a really great um, sort of structure underlying everything because it's this is sort of in my mind the most important part of the drawing if you're if you're really trying to go for some amount of believability and accuracy obviously your own creative interpretation of the head is totally up to you but um, I generally tend to draw a little bit more towards realism and so I uh, like using something like this to, to make sure that things are balanced um, that features are generally in the right place And so we don't get any weird asymmetries or lopsidedness. I'm also going to start looking for some shadow shapes here. That nostril's a little bit high. I'm going to start looking for some shadow shapes here uh, so that I can kind of know where light versus dark exists. Just to help with kind of mapping out the features even more. And then let's go ahead and get uh, the mouth in here. Just got a more pronounced upper lip. Kind of think about think about the mouth the tooth cylinder, and think about how that's going to protrude outward a little bit more, just so I can get some depth. Um, I know that the corner of the mouth generally tends to be on the inside of the iris. I'm not going to kind of get in there and draw too much of this mouth area because that's going to be shadow. Um, how do we want to handle the hands? That's one of the questions that I have for myself. I don't know yet. I'm going to start finding the contours of the head. Again, thinking about shadow shapes here. Uh, 
how's chat doing over here? Why do I use red pencils? Uh, why do I use red pencil? Just the color I picked. I can literally cho choose any color and that color will end up mixing in because these are water soluble colored pencils. So that color will end up mixing into my paints and just adding a nice additional kind of layer of, um, of color interest. So no particular reason. I know that I'm gonna be sticking with some sort of warmer colors in general. So that uh, that's informing that decision a little bit. And let's kind of round out this jaw a little bit more. I think you can see that we're, we're arriving at a head-like shape here. The brows aren't too dark. Just want to keep that in mind when I am drawing, painting the brows. I'm going to stub in these irises. And um, what else we got going on here? We got some sh cast shadows happening in the chin area. If I'm moving too fast for you, it's just because, um, well, I use this method a lot, so it's, it's really familiar. And once you get it down, you can, you know, within a couple of minutes, really kind of get, uh, get something down on the paper, uh, which is great but I'm also trying to, ugh, it's already 20 minutes in. Okay, hands. We're gonna think about these as sort of boxes. I don't know if I'm gonna get the size of these right, or this hand right. Go back in space, it's gonna splay out. Usually, I'm not very, very practiced anymore in doing um, non-portrait stuff, so this is probably going to look a little strange, is my guess. So we've got the hand shape of the sort of meat of the hand. Probably just try to ab abstract these a little bit and keep them, keep them simple just as like a grouping or a clump here of fingers. I'm not going to focus on these as the primary part of the painting. I'll just kind of move around more in the face today, so just so you know. So, I don't know. That's hand-ish. Just trying to think about the shadow shapes here. Let that be the thing that makes them feel round. And then we will come in and find that other shadow shape. Pull this down. Okay. And we've got some neck stuff happening back here. My measurements are off a little bit, I can tell. And got another shadow, just kind of really stubbing these in quick. And then we'll just kind of block it off. So there's our face. Um, I don't think there's really anything else I want to add in terms of detail. Just want to look at those shadows a little bit and make sure that they're all, generally speaking, in the, the rightish place. Okay. And we get this, this helix. Cool. Cool. All right. Where's my chat? Can I remove any watercolor pencil marks? Uh, 
I can erase them to some degree and I can use water to wash them out, um, but I, I'll be able to paint directly over them. Oh crap, I just realized something. I didn't do my very important step of prepping a paper towel for holding my colors. So we're gonna do that in a very impromptu ad hoc way. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm going to um, take my paper towel. I don't know why I just switched that. I'm going to take my paper towel. I'm going to fold it in half. I've just got like a little square paper towel. I'm actually going to dip it directly into my water here and squeegee it with my fingers. Sorry, you can't see this. Um, all I'm trying to do is like get a really damp paper towel and I'm putting it over on my palette. Put it there, start squeezing out my paints. Usually about a, I don't know, pinky fingers worth of paint, your first uh, knuckles worth of a digit. So we got blue, we got yellow ochre, we've got red. We've got about a half hour to make progress. So <laughs> let's see what we can take, what we can accomplish in that amount of time. Uh, this is probably gonna be, end up being a very quick sketch. So I've just laid out my paints on my palette. I'm going to go in and do some really fast washes here. So I'm taking a flat brush. Um, I'm gonna try to make it so you all can see the mixing of the paint, but also the painting itself a little bit better. Um, and don't want it to be sort of hard to see. Okay, that's about as good as I'm gonna get. So I'm gonna dip in, get a bunch of water. Um, I'm seeing something like a, like a light uh, grayish kind of color. So I'm gonna mix a bunch of different colors together to get a kind of grayish color. I'm not gonna go for like super duper color accuracy here. I'm gonna try to put it toward a little bit of blue. Add a lot of water here. Now I'm adding a lot of water and I'm not adding white because I want this to be more of a wash uh, as we go in. And it's probably, it's looking like it's gonna be a little bit green, which actually might not end up looking too bad. So using a lot of water here, just gonna kinda scrub in some of this. And you're gonna see that I'm like gonna pick up some of that, that red pencil. I think it's terracotta as the color. Use more water. It's a little bit darker than I would have wanted, what I wanted. Usually, if anybody's seen my drawings, you'll know that I'm a pretty, pretty, like I'm pretty tight with my drawing, um, and. Paint is like painting is really sometimes very difficult for me because um, it's just can be hard for me to kind of let go a little bit and paint and just let it let things kind of flow and breathe and uh, so it's a it's a nice it's a nice challenging medium for me. Okay, this is actually more of a gray than what I just did. Using a lot of water here. Barely any pigment on the, barely any pigment on the, in the, these brush strokes here. What I'm trying to do right now is I'm just trying to um, give myself something to work into. Because I don't want to work just directly on the white in this particular case. And we would normally just be kind of going over 
everything here. So this red is really kind of getting in there because I went so dark with it, so much darker than I normally would. So we're getting a lot of um, sort of this red, red pigment. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep a paper towel handy. and make sure that I can dab some of this off so that there's not so much pigment in there kind of coming through. Nice little lesson learned here for myself. Oop. I was thinking about kind of resurrecting a little bit of, I guess you can call it a style. I would call it more of like a, a mark making technique, but just using like really, um, really geometric kind of like blocky shapes to lay down paint and just kind of just do big gestural stuff and then kind of work back to small. So we might try that. Now I'm kind of mad that I used all of that red on the page, but it's fine. It's all fine. Everything's fine. Y'all just, just, just relax. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be fine. Okay, so we just kind of like scrubbed in a lot of um, a lot of like wash washy colors, uh, and it's very transparent. So this is sort of like the way that you can use gouache to be a little bit more like watercolor. Is just add a ton of water to it, and I do mean a lot of water. Uh, because the pigment particles in the gouache are bigger than watercolor, and so that's what makes it more opaque. And usually chalk is kind of added as an additional sort of filler element to make it a little bit more opaque depending upon the brand. And with all of that, you end up um, having to like dilute it a lot more in order to get it to be really transparent. So we're going to go in and we're just going to start painting. And what I mean by that is I'm going to now that I've got something to paint into, I'm just going to start sort of mixing some colors. I'm thinking about the hair right now, and I want to get some of the more dark values in here. Um, so I'm just going to be using, I'm going to keep my paper towel at hand to blot out any of these wetter areas since we're working a little bit more wet into wet. And I want to be careful not to get too much water. Um, on my brush just so I can get keep this pretty fairly opaque. It's not going to be super opaque otherwise it would be really hard to um, to paint with. It would hard, be hard, like I wouldn't get a lot of fluidity. So, um, so I'm using my flat, continuing to use my flat here, my flat brush, to use these more sort of geometric shapes or do more geometric shapes. And I'm just going for like big block in stuff, adding a little bit of water here and there. And when I mean a little bit, I mean just like barely touching my brush to the water. Because so I don't want this to be too too transparent. Just looking for some of these shadow shapes. I'm gonna bring in a little bit of red here to turn this more neutral kind of black color. A little bit of orange also. 
a little bit more red to address some of these shadow shapes since we're getting a little bit more into the skin. I want to warm that up a little bit. Now these, these brushes are a little bit new to me. Um, so I might switch away here in a, in a second because I'm not 100% sure that I'm into them. And it's because they kind of splay a little bit when I apply them to the page. And I'm not a fan of that, but we'll see how it goes. So I'm, I usually approach my muses and my reference photos when I use reference photos with an emphasis on um, looking for really sort of dramatic light. So I'm looking for really high contrast reference. And that helps me like sort of define the face through shadow shapes rather than trying to get these really sort of subtle values um, and value shifts, which can be just be really, really difficult. Uh, Rat Mammy says, uh, just going back a little bit in chat here. It's going to come up. Yeah, I was thinking, I was making the mistake of sticking the entire brush into the glob of paint. At some point, you kind of do want to do that, like when you want your paints to be really opaque. Um, but in this, for me, in this beginning stage, I was actually considering um, doing a little bit more direct painting for this for this particular stream because I wanted just to try that uh, more, more uh, sorry, I should say, I wanted to try a little bit more direct painting sooner rather than like layering. Uh, so we might just like jump into some of that and just show that we can kind of build, build up a painting using the opacity of gouache to help, um, layer just like through opaqueness, but I'm not sure if I'm ready to switch over to that just yet. Still being a little rough with these edges and stuff because it's not super crucial that you get them right because we can always paint over them. I can already tell you I'm not going to get this painting done during the stream, um, and that's okay because uh, I'll continue working on it and then I'll post it to like my Instagram. Um, uh, Diane Zimmerman says, is that watercolor or gouache? It is gouache. It is gouache. That was a little too much water. I'm constantly just kind of like adding red, yellow, and blue to this to just kind of continue to unify the colors. Not using like a straight blue and just putting that down. I want to bring some color harmony throughout, so I want to see the, these colors kind of exist everywhere in the painting. Just looking at shadow shapes right now. Using a big brush right now, um, in my mind, is it's helpful because it forces you not to be able to get into the details and forces you to be able just to, to look at um, the big gestures of a painting. Um, what are the big shapes? Things like that. So I definitely recommend um, when you're approaching this moment in a painting, if you are going to take a little bit more of a layering approach, that you look at that that uh, your subject matter from that sort of vantage point, um, forcing yourself to look big and then work to small. That way you just, you don't get mired in the details too early.
So I'm just just looking for lights and darks right now. That's really that's really my objective here. Get some rid of some of this white. Squinting my eyes a lot so I can see where values start shifting toward more toward the shadow. I'm just going to soften up these edges a little bit by adding a little bit of water uh, to my brush and just brushing across the edges. Okay, where are we at? We got 20 minutes. Let's start doing some more direct painting. I'm just going to rinse out my brush here. I think I'm going to switch over to one of my other one of my other flats. Just not really enjoying this flat right now. So I've got another flat. It's basically the same thing. It's just a little bit smaller, but I, I just like the quality of the brush a little bit better. Um, so I want to make sure I don't have too much water on my palette. I've got some pooling happening, so I'm just going in with that paper towel that I have. Some of this has already dried up, which is great. And we're going to end up just kind of mixing straight into this. We don't need to create new areas or anything like that. And I'm going to try to make uh, sort of a middle, a middle value here. I haven't dipped into water yet. I'm going to dip now just a little bit just to make this a little bit more fluid. And what, we're, what we've got here is a little bit of a... I want to neutralize this orange a little bit, dipping some blue in there, a little bit more water, get it to move around a little bit. Now this is not, this is darker than a middle gray. I want to get somewhere in, if I were to look at a value scale, I want to get somewhere not in middle gray, which is here. You can see that it's actually a little bit darker. It's probably something like that. I want to get it up to probably about an eight. So this is going to be one of those times because I want to start painting more directly that I'm actually going to take some white. I recommend if you do have something like this, you can have this handy. So this is closer to an eight, I think. Yeah, somewhere in there. Uh, gouache, when it dries, it will dry a little bit. Um, the light colors dry a little bit darker than what you see on your palette, and the light colors dry a little bit uh, sorry, the light colors dry a little bit darker, the dark colors dry a little bit lighter, and this brush isn't working for me either, which is bumming me out. It is also splaying, but I just want to get some color down. I'm going to warm that up a little bit. Right now I've got something that's close to a middle gray, a little bit lighter, and a little bit more lightness. And I'm just going to start kind of throwing this in, in areas where I see this value happening. Gouache can be a little bit difficult when you it's like, number one, you shouldn't mix a tremendous amount of paint at any given point in time because it, it dries so quickly. So it can then, set, like because of that, it can be very difficult to kind of get that color again uh, as, you're, as you're painting. So you're constantly going to be shifting sort of between different, different hues, uh, which, is, which is okay. It's like one of the charming things about gouache is that it's kind of almost... It's not impossible, but it's, it can be really difficult to replicate the color the same way every time as you put it down. But you'll get better with it over time. So I'm just, again, using this like very flat brush, adding very little bits of water, using a lot of white now to apply my paint. So it's going on a lot more opaque now. And I'm thinking about this. I just want to get like really nice, big, chunky shapes in here. That's my, that's my goal right now. Uh, 
Naomi asks me what brand of gouache I'm using. I am using Windsor & Newton uh, Designers Gouache, and I'm also using um, Arteza, uh, an Arteza Vermilion. I have noticed that with that paint, sometimes the, the pigment particles, I feel like, a are a little bit less consistent than some of the other sort of more expensive brands. And that's why I like to try out different brands of paint. It's so I can understand what the colors look like, how, how the paint actually responds on the page. Um, and yeah, if you have that opportunity, then I recommend you do it as well. But it's not bad paint by any means. It's, it's, it's relatively inexpensive which is really nice. And you get a really wide assortment of colors, which I don't think, personally, I don't think you really need, but I've recently been just like trying out the more ridiculous colors just to see what they look like and feel like. And I think that's where the pigments really kind of fall apart with that, with that particular brand, is um, when you end up doing some of the unnatural pigments, I would say. Still doing this like very chunky block in of color here. I want to keep the brush kind of big so that I am not super focused on the details. I am mixing colors and trying to find a home for them that feels right. And we are going in relatively opaque with these colors. So we're going to be able to cover up whatever we're painting on top of every time we make a mark. So don't be afraid to make any mistakes with, with this. I'm going to get a little bit more blue, cool this off a little bit. Okay, I think. So Porcupine Pancake asks, is there a reason I started with the shadow areas first? Apologies if you did answer this and I missed it. Um, usually I start with the shadow areas first because that is how I am able to um, sort of really look at light and dark. I always look at an image from sort of its two extreme uh, lighting conditions and values so that um, I can create an image that reads as, uh, as an image, like as a face, very quickly. Um, it also immediately kind of gives me a sense of where my shadow values are, uh, or sorry, yeah, where my shadow values are versus where my light values are um, right out of the gate. And it means that I should, should never, in my lightest values, never go darker um, than what I end up denoting as my shadow values. And so I block out the big shapes first to denote those areas. And then I know that I need to try to keep my, keep my values compressed in those specific areas. That was a little mistake there, which is fine. I'm going to go ahead and get a little bit more red in here. Now we're kind of moving into that shadow, shadow family. This is probably about a five, I would say, in the value scale, maybe a little bit darker than that. You can see I'm just kind of gradually sort of building up um, all of these, these shapes. And eventually, with enough determination, <laughs> you'll end up getting a painting that starts to have dim dimension and form and um, really 
start to feel um, contiguous. It just takes time to build up a painting like this in this way. And again, you would end up sort of moving from, you know, maybe some of these bigger shapes to some smaller shapes is the idea here. And I'm doing it very, um, very loosely. And even though I'm not going to finish this painting during this session, um, I'm going to continue sort of doing this technique and then I will show you what it looks like and I'm going to try my best to avoid to avoid um, overworking the painting and going to, into too many details and losing some of these really sort of more expressive brush strokes. This for me this would be a, this desire this activity of trying to keep things really loose is a very difficult thing for me to do. Uh, JC Brown asks me, what is the brand and size of brush you're using now? Honestly, I don't know. This says it's a 10. It's a flat. It's a protege. I got it in a an art box, like a subscription box thing. Um, the only times I've ever purchased like more expensive brands of paint, or sorry, of brushes, are when I have, uh, for oil painting, when I was really trying to find a, a quality oil brush that um, was like boar's bristle and had a really strong sense of form to it and allowed me to aggressively put the paint on the page um, so I could keep really sharp forms and things like that. Um, but otherwise, these are all just really relatively inexpensive. This is probably the most expensive brush, but I have no idea how expensive it is. Oh, thanks, Otter Love. Um, Crafty, you're interested in getting better at gouache, but uh, it's very backwards to watercolor. Yeah, it's very backwards to watercolor. I, I, I think that that's actually one of the reasons why I really love it is because it allows you to work up as opposed to having to work backward by applying darks in layers over top of lights. And I don't have to reserve the light. I don't have to think about that, which is really in my mind, very freeing, and it dries so fast. It's almost like working with acrylic. I'm actually going to turn this brightness down. The the uh, light in my apartment's getting a little little bright. Um, it's very similar to acrylics in that it does dry so fast, which is really nice. But unlike acrylics, it can be reactivated, which is one of my other favorite properties of gouache. So if I wanted to, I could just put more water on my brush and kind of scrub a little bit and I can get that that color underneath to really pick up and, and come back to life, which is super cool. So if I wanted to get something that was a little bit of a softer blend, I don't blend a lot. I you know wash is really meant for doing sort of lots of very intentional marks and, and shapes, but if I wanted to I could get a, a sort of more of a softer gradation if I needed to um, in certain areas, which is very, very cool. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm just kind of continuing just to move along in a different sort of set of colors here and there. Um, let's go ahead and just get some of these lighter values in here, um, just so you can kind of start to see a more kind of complete, completish painting. Uh, 
super super username 147 asks can I take the same approach as watercolor by going from light to dark if I choose um, well that's what you're used to at this point yeah you can it's a little different though because you're you that reactivating property that I just talked about um, is something to look out for if you try to do that because so with watercolor once you kind of get the paint down for the most part it's it stays pretty pretty fixed in place it's it's a little bit harder to reactivate and that's a good thing because it means that you can paint over other paint and um, do that la more layering kind of process with gouache like I said if you're if you're kind of going in if you're going in thin, you'll end up reactivating it. So it's harder to get that kind of layering effect. But you can absolutely just like, as long as you're painting opaquely, you can absolutely go in and um, start with lights if you want to, and then just gradually build the dark uh, if, that, if that sort of in your head makes more sense. It's totally possible to do it that way. But you just really got to paint opaquely if you're going to do that. And what I mean by that is use very little water. And you can always bring the values back up. That's what's great. You can just take it up. Um, Sandra Rice asks, um, you signed up for the 30-day class, but you've never used either medium. That's fun. I'm excited for you for that. Uh, do you suggest do all the watercolors at one time and then move into the gouache or switching back and forth? Okay, switching back and forth is going to be okay because I think that they're going to release them. Um, well, they release them sort of one day, you know, one lesson at a time. And so you're kind of at the mercy of what gets released. And so you'll sort of naturally end up switching back and forth because of that. Um, and that's, that's good. The, the cool thing is about gouache versus watercolor is that they are cousins. So you can absolutely sort of use gouache a little bit like, mostly like watercolor. You can use them together as well, which is a very neat feature of, uh, of the paints. So they're, they're really compatible with each other and things that you learn in watercolor can be applied to gouache, um, a little bit less so the other way around. So. I think getting exposure to both mediums, since they're very similar, um, will just end up making you better at both at the same time. I don't think there's any reason to stick with one or the other. Just kind of going in with some more blue shadows here. Um, we're, we're, we're using big shapes still, so are some of these, some of these uh, shapes in our like things like eyes and stuff are they feel they feel kind of wonky you know like you can kind of see that in here um, and that's okay like I said we're we're uh, for me I'm going for more more of these sort of um, big intentional shapes and seeing if I can get it to read okay just by doing that alone. And then if I want to, I can always come back and go into more detail. So these eyes feel off, and that's OK. Uh, let's see. Lydia asks, that little thing will work. Which colors would you recommend for the 3030? Uh, to be honest, I, I think that different artists are going to use different colors. Um, so I don't think there are probably any specifics, but I would, I would, I would believe that uh, you would get away with just a, red, a good red, yellow, and blue um, would, would get you a long way. Like I'm a big believer in just working with the primaries in general. So that would sort of satisfy, that satisfies my particular lessons for sure. Um, it's all I ever really use. I think buying very specific colors, it can, it can help like having a warm red versus a cool red, etc. but you really don't need a whole lot of colors on your palette in order to create a good painting because it can mix kind of you know not the full spectrum and it's full chroma but I can mix kind of all the colors um, all the colors in sort of the color spectrum for the most part with just red yellow and blue uh, Ellen asks 
Because gouache dries faster, do you find flat brushes work better for you than round or filbert? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think that those they just leave different marks. Is is the thing different quality of mark? And I feel like I can get much more fluid marks with a nice round, and I load it up with paint, and that can be really really nice as well. This gives you just more of like a geometric kind of boxy feel. Um, I want to I want to uh, be mindful of time here. Uh, it is 9.57 in the Pacific time zone. Um, we didn't get a, super far with this, but I think that you know if we take a look at what's happening here, what I'm doing is I'm mixing values. And I, again, I went in with sort of the, the darker colors first just to lay down my shadow shapes. And then I started building up by identifying some of the lighter shapes now, or lighter colors. Now these colors originally, I said we were in like an eight, Sorry, you can't see this, an eight in the value scale, but now it's dried something closer to in between value four and value seven. So that value is somewhere in between there. So this is one of the properties of gouache to kind of look out for. You'll work your painting, you'll work your painting, and then things will dry darker that are lighter, and things will dry lighter that are darker. This is actually really matte and starting to get lighter in value. So you'll want to kind of keep doing this push-pull, push-pull, and just keep working and keep paying attention to how things are changing because you'll always need to kind of add probably more color in different areas to keep things generally balanced. But I'm just going to keep working on this this morning, and I'm going to bring it back, uh, bring the sort of the full form and the full value range into this into this piece and kind of leave it relatively rough, and I'll, I'll post it on my Instagram. Um, I'm going to answer some of these last questions here. Uh, yeah, can I slide my pan over so I can see the colors? Absolutely. Um, so I'm just using um, ultramarine blue, vermilion red, yellow ochre. You can always watch the video again, and you'll see it when I, in the in the beginning what my colors are, and titanium white. And I'm just constantly like mixing pools. By the time I get sort of a little bit of the first lay in here, what I'll have is I'll have this really great palette of dry paint that I can reactivate with water, and I just end up making like a mess. Uh, of color, like using it really in like a muddy fashion, which is really one of the benefits of gouache as well. is very similar to water, watercolor where you can just kind of do some like mixing on the fly. Uh, Susan asked, do I ever use acrylic gouache? No, I haven't actually used acrylic gouache yet. I'm really interested. Um, Mariah asks, it helps to photograph your work and edit it to black and white to check your values too. Yes, that is absolutely a, um, a great way to figure out if your values are correct. Another great way is to step away from it and just squint. Um, you'll, you'll start to see where things start to feel like they're too bright or too dark. Uh, Carol asks, uh, can we use the same brushes for watercolor and gouache? Absolutely. Um, and what size is that pan? Uh, I would say it's probably like six by six by nine, something like that. Doesn't have to be that big. I find this is a nice size when you're working in this size. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it here. Um, switch back to my old uh, live stream cam. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Like I said, I'm gonna keep working on this this morning, and I'll post something a little bit later today. So if you check out my Instagram, which is Instagram uh, at Mike Creighton, all one word. You'll see what this ends up looking like, and I'm going to keep it rough and push myself far away from getting really detailed, and we'll see how that feels. Um, hopefully this helped you understand a little bit of like how to apply gouache or how to build up a painting in gouache. You definitely don't have to do it this way. If you do the 30 Faces 30 Days Watercolor and Gouache Challenge starting in two days, um, I actually do a couple of other different techniques, or at least one different technique from this, which I, I really uh, like as well. So hopefully that's uh, that helps you out. There's so many different ways to use gouache, and um, I encourage you to try it if you haven't. So I'm just looking over the chat one more time, and thank you all for for joining this mo this morning. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for letting me just kind of mess around, um, and thank you, Sketchy, for linking to my uh, my Instagram. So yeah, have a great day. Have a great weekend. Have a great rest of your night if you're further east than me. And hopefully I'll see you in the sketchy 30 faces 30 days challenge happening just next month in March. Please sign up. Uh, promo code 30F30D Mike if you want to save $5 USD off your purchase.
Cool. All right, that's it for me, and I'll see you in a future stream and in a future class.